You guys ready for this? Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. So glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mark Benia, and we're here today to celebrate the release of the Keith Emerson Tribute Concert DVD, which has been five years in the making. So we're, uh, we have a lot of friends, we have a lot of stories to tell, a lot of people to, to uh, help us with that. And uh, I was able to coerce uh, my good friend, uh, you'll probably know him from KLOS, The Mark and Brian Show, that's Mark Thompson, he's going to be uh, here as the master of ceremonies. So let's go to him right now. Yep. Hey, Mark. How about that? How, that uh, was a pretty Mark good is, interview. That was a that was pretty good, wasn't it? Dude, I don't think you need me. Quite, oh yes, quite I frankly. Do. Um, let me. I was taught in school to give an overview when you give a report, and let me just let you know exactly what it is that we're doing. We got a two-hour plus show. But the main thing you need to know is this gentleman you just heard speak, Mark Benia, had the joy and the privilege of getting to know Keith Emerson and his music. He worked with Keith, he produced Keith, he performed with Keith, and it is because of the heart and the passion of that man that what you're about to see is the reason it took place. So here is what you need to know. An incredible concert has taken place in tribute of Keith and his music with the absolute best players in the last 50 years of music. And Benia told me that this concert was just a special night where everybody was on. And now, after many, many years of Benia's hard work trying to find a company that would release this without profit, because all of the money that we're going to ask you to please spend on this DVD will go to charity. And we'll explain that. But that's what you need to know. This DVD has been years in the making. It is finally going to be released. And if you've ever been touched by the music or the man, Keith Emerson, this is a unique and very special opportunity for you to get this incredible concert. So we're going to get into all of that, but that's really why we're here. I want to talk about Benia, and when I first met him, back in the, uh, the Mark and Brian days, we would have musical guests come in, and Toy Matinee was a favorite. They had this song called Last Plane Out, absolutely fantastic. And so uh, Toy Matinee was going to come in and perform on the show, and Benia was a member of Toy Matinee. And what I love, this happened not only the first time they came in, but every time they came in, I would get to sit there five minutes before air, and I would get to watch Benia and Kevin Gilbert 
bicker back and forth about what they were going to do and then what they weren't going to do. And by the way, it wasn't fighting. It was like brothers snipping. And it was hysterical. <laughs> and it went nowhere. It, 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 it had no end and no purpose. But they did it every <laughs> single time they came in. And I got... I, I would always say, hey, let's have Toy Matinee in so I can watch him fight. <laughs> uh, it's, it's absolutely true. And I fell in love with, with Mark Benilla, and he and I have been friends 30 years plus. There's not a single time that, that, that I would call Benilla when I needed him, and he would be there for me regardless. Didn't matter the time frame, he was there. He called me and asked me to involve myself in this project. And I didn't even let him get 10 seconds into his pitch no. when I said, of course, of course I'm in. Uh, the relationship, Mark Benia said to me once, I never thought, I never would have dreamed that I, when I heard the music of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, that I would have the opportunity to not only meet him, but work with him. And they had a very special relationship, both privately and professionally. So, Mark, before we get into the minutia of what all's going on, I think this is a good time for you to talk about your relationship with Keith as a musician and as a person. Well, with Keith, I mean, the first time I met him, I was in a club in uh, San Jose, California. We happened to be playing a tune that I was in the process of recording with Ronnie Montrose in uh, the studio. He was bankrolling my first demo, my first guitar instrumental demo. We happened to be playing this tune as this guy from the back of the club walks in. I said, it's got to look like Keith Emerson, but I dismissed it right away. Can't be. Turns out it was. Like we stopped. Uh, we took a break. He came up and he introduced himself. And I was kind of just in shock. And, and, he, and he said, uh, what was that last tune you played? And I said, uh, it's called White Noise. And he goes, are you going to record it? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, do you mind if I play piano on it? And <laughs> I, I just look at And so the only thing I could think to say was, well, what have you done? You know, like, like, <laughs> like thinking he was going to get the joke, right? No, he didn't get the, he starts giving me his resume. He says, well, I was in a band called The Noise, and then I had a band called EOP. You know, I was like, stop, stop, stop. I know who you are, okay? I have posters of you in my room that were witness to only things that myself were, you know? So it was like, come on. And then the next question he asked me was, do you water ski? Which was not the next question I was anticipating. And of course I went, sure, you know, I've never water skiing. So we went out the next day and got to know each other on a water skiing boat, you know, which was very David Lynchian, you know, and it's, and it's kind of vibe. But uh, he said, yeah, I'm making a record with Kevin Gilbert. Would you want to be the guitar player on it? And I said, uh, yeah. And, uh, and so I met Keith and Kevin in the same weekend, you know, and, and the rest wow. was, was musical kind of history, I guess, for me, you know. So, but it shows you what kind of a guy he was. Keith never took himself seriously, but he took what he did serious. And that's the whole thing uh, with all of his music. I mean, when he was doing his music, it was completely, you know, he was completely in, in, immersed in it. But he never saw himself as the icon that everybody painted him as. He, he just uh, was too humble of a guy, you know, but... That's what gave him his charm and his likability, you know. So that's uh, so, and that's why we connected. We just we loved each other. We were musical allies, and we trusted each other. And and uh, you know, I'm I'm a, such a better musician uh, for being part of that. And the fact I got to pay it back a little bit. All the years that he had given me growing up in my formative years, now I was able to help, you know, with him. So it, it, it's been such a great a great honor for me. And this tribute uh, concert is another another place that it was kind of like the, the high point for me in that. Um, so, Mark, let's just for a little bit get into, and, and, the, and the reason I bring this up is because on the Mark and Brian program, we had this event every year, the Mark and Brian Christmas show. We were literally the first radio station to have a Christmas show. And it was, for us, it was the thank you at the end of the year for listening. The tickets were free and we would have musical acts and comedians and all this. And it was the hardest ticket to get. You had to win them on the show from us. And we had some of the biggest acts in the business. And then word came down, and I think we're talking about 1990, 91. Word came down that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer were going to do the show. 
and I have obviously knew of them and and knew of their music, but I didn't know the power of that statement when it was announced that that was because it became a thing at that point. It was a massive, massive undertaking to have them on stage. And I don't even know, Mark, if they were still together as a group then when they did that. Do you remember? Yeah, this they moment? were. They were out touring uh, at that point. They had reconvened uh, for a while. So, yeah, so they were that's why they were so good. You know, they they were like, I remember that show. I have a picture of me. It's it's uh, it's basically melp, you know, because I'm in there in the, on the on the, <laughs> on the end. And Keith just like pulled me into the group. All of a sudden they were going, who's this guy? He's a guitar player. What's he doing here? You know, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Just hurry up. Take the photo, man, because I'm not leaving until the photo gets snapped, you know, and I have that up in my studio. But, yeah, that was an amazing morning. It was actually, I was going to say night, but none of this was at night, wasn't it? It was like six in the morning. And uh, so, yeah, that was an amazing. That was amazing. Well, all your all the Christmas shows are amazing in their own right. But that was definitely a high point. Um, so I, I, I want to get into this. The reason that we're here, the reason this is happening, the reason this DVD is for sale, the reason this concert took place is that this man, Keith Emerson, who Mark uh, has kindly talked about, uh, real life came up for him. Keith suffered from uh, a disease called focal dystonia. And we're going to learn a great deal about what that is. But Mark, because of his relationship with Keith, took it upon himself after Keith's passing to put together this tribute concert with the best players, because Mark is one of the best players. So when he, you know, picks up the phone and calls his buddies, here's what we're doing. And you know what? Uh, the two groups that I've learned give back the most are classic rock fans and musicians. Yeah. When one of their own is struggling, they come together and they do a thing. And this concert is exactly that. Mark has worked endlessly years to find a company that would sell this DVD without taking a piece. All of the money that we're going to ask you to spend today on this DVD concert, number one, you're going to get one of the greatest shows ever, but the money goes directly to the charities. Uh, Mark, let's talk about uh, Red Cherry. Let's talk about the concert, how you got it together. Uh, take us into that world for now and how people can get the DVD. Okay. The uh, Yeah, I held out for five years because there was a lot of people that wanted to release it, but they all wanted a cut from it. And the, the, the reason that we, we did this to beginning, the beginning was to pay tribute to Keith. That was the number one reason, to, to pay, pay heed to his legacy. But the second reason was all the proceeds we decided were going to go to charity. And we're going to go to the disease that, that Keith suffered from uh, with his hand. Uh, and so all of the players that you'll meet, most of them here tonight, tonight or this afternoon, uh, were they, without, just like you did, without even hesitating. But yeah, what do you need? And there were, you know, and all these guys could helm their own bands. I mean, these, are, these aren't like sidemen. These were guys that were used to, to captaining their own ships. And they all put their egos over there if they had any to begin with. And all said, we're servants of whatever the music needs. And that's, it was an amazing thing to, to be part of that, you know. And I basically just kind of got out of their way because they, they all chose the tunes that they wanted to play that meant the most to them. And it was great. We had such a great variety of that. So trying to find a company that was going to uh, move forward with that kind of sentiment, not easy to find. But Martin Darville uh, at uh, QEDG Management uh, called in a favor and uh, asked Cherry Red Records if they might be open to that. And of course, they were already handling the ELP catalog. And they said, absolutely, what do you need? And uh, it was amazing. So it took five years before we found the right source for that to happen. And with the cooperation of the Emerson Estate, Damon and, and Aaron and, and Joanne, you know, they were so cooperative and so supportive for that. Uh, it was it was wonderful, and it was just it was just like the concert. It was just effortless at that point, you know, to to get the rest of it, get that last ten yards that we needed to get this thing across the uh, the goal line. So, uh, but with focal dystonia, yeah, it's a debilitating disease, and uh, and Mari Kawaguchi is here to talk about that because she'll give you a little bit more uh, insight into the actual disease and the charity that uh, this will go to service. Uh, Maury, let's let's do talk about that because I, I I looked it up and I did some reading before this show and it's debilitating in that and Mark can witness this that uh, it seems as though a lot of musicians suffer from this particular 
disease. And so explain to everybody what this is and what it does. Yes, uh, focal dystonia is also called musician's dystonia. Um, it afflicts many musicians and then most of them don't know what they have. And if you notice uh, the later video of Keith, you see his fingers curled up. That's what happens. And the reason that I decided, or that we decided that we should donate to this foundation is because the research hasn't been done, not much research has been done about it, and it's still very complicated to treat and diagnose. And from like 1990s, Keith was seeking treatment and diagnosis of this, and it hasn't been successful. And until his death, we went to many, many doctors, travel all over to seek the treatment, but it just didn't much for him. And this is why I like to uh, contribute to this foundation to further the, the research of this uh, really horrible disease for musicians. Now, you, many people say, well, Keith could have composed, he didn't have to play anymore. But when you know musicians whose whole life was playing, and then what they believe is that that's the only thing they could have done in their life, is it just devastates them. And in focal dystonia, I've been talking to the, uh, the organizers of this foundation, and it doesn't only uh, affect you physically, but it affects you mentally. Many are depressed, and the depression also contributes to dystonia also. And I'm not a doctor, so I can't really go into the, the de details of it. But if you go to the uh, dystonia-research.org, uh, you will find more information about it. So that uh, all the uh, proceeds from the, the concert and the DVD is going to Dystonia Medical Research Foundation for musicians. And also, they also, you can see on the screen, they also uh, started up Keith Emerson Fund also to go to the research of this disease. Now, Mari, you would be the best to answer this question in that not only was Keith battling the disease itself and what it did to his fingers, but the mental side of it, this disease was taking away his number one love in life. And that must have been devastating for him mentally. It sure was. Um, if you knew Keith well, music was his whole life. He was like music <clears throat> himself. Everywhere we went, he was composing in a restaurant. He started composing on the napkins and everything he did was music. So you can imagine the, uh, what happens mentally to these people who everything was taken away from them. So it did contribute to his depression and his mental state. And this is why the, this research is very important. Uh, Mari, I assume that you were there that evening for that concert and you watched some of these musicians, the greatest players in the world, bring to life uh, your fella's love, his music, his talent was there alive, vibrant for two and a half, three hours. That must have been a great deal to you. Yes, and I like to say um, this particular concert was just so special. The reason is because when Keith passed, soon after Keith passed, Mark and I got together with uh, several musicians who played at the concert. And we wanted this to be like by the friends, for the friends, and um, We didn't have any budget, and this was done only by the love and goodwill of people. We didn't have any sponsorship, uh, any kind of la la record labels or management, none of that. I think we wanted it to be that way because we wanted this concert to be our concert. Mm -hmm. And I just can't thank enough for all people who are involved, musicians, crew, volunteers, people who donated money, and especially the audience who flew in from all over the world. And uh, the, it was the audience who made it special too. And when I stood in the uh, stage to give a short speech, I just felt this overwhelming love in this room. And I'm not really into that kind of spirituality, but I could feel Keith's presence. And I think everybody can agree with that. He was there. And that's what uh, made this uh, concert very special.
Mari, thank you so very much for taking time to be with us. We're going to do our best to sell a lot of product today and help this this horrid disease that has affected many. And thank you for your time and coming in today and everything you've done to help put this together. Thank you. Uh, Benia taught me long ago. He said, Thompson, let me tell you something. When you're going to release a DVD, when you're going to put together a package that you want people to enjoy, and especially when it is based in Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, you got to have artwork. If he said it once, he said it twice. Yes. You got you to gotta have artwork. And honestly, when you see these images by this gentleman, uh, you can tell that it was based on the artwork that we came to know as Emerson Lake and Palmer. We welcome in Jerry LaFaro. Mr. LaFaro, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Nice to see you. Well, I can tell by what I've already seen is that you seem to be pretty good at this art thing, young fella. <laughs> well, I like you called me young fella. Well, you know... Uh, <laughs> I've uh, I've been uh, an illustrator uh, in working uh, in publishing and advertising for 30 years, and I'm going to tell you that when I had the opportunity to do this piece, because I, I've been a fan of ELP in Emerson since the age of 16, uh, this is kind of the kind of the I could drop the mic on my illustration career um, with this piece. Uh, it was a joy to be asked to do it, and and to work on it, and uh, it's just so happy to be part of this. Now, uh, explain a little bit about, uh, as a fan of the music and as an artist, how the images that we would see on the albums of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer depicted the music that we were listening to on the inside and how maybe you used that to come up with your version of this this art package. Well, you, you know, I was the, the art, the music was so powerful and the images were, were really powerful. The, the, you know, the original Tarkus art, um, uh, brain salad surgery, of course. And, you know, th that, that's a lot to live up to. Uh, so I knew that I, I, was, I was really stepping into hallowed ground. But I felt pretty confident as, uh, you know, as a longtime fan and uh, with, with such a deep love of the music that, that I could bring my A game to it. So, um, so... We, we were, I was asked to reimagine Tarkus, and I chose the battlefield scene, and, uh, you know, it, I kind of approached it, Mark, wanted, we wanted to do something very realistic, so I kind of thought about Tarkus on steroids, and I, yeah. I developed this piece, and I gave everything uh, into this. This was, this was so much fun to work on. The more I worked on it, the, the more I found to do in terms of, of, of bringing out the details and going, going steps further than, than William Neal did with, with the detail and adding to the story, so to speak, you know, by adding the keyboard that, that, that was the battle that was, you know, clearly my nod, nod to Keith. And, uh, it, uh, it, you know, all the elements just, you know, That's surrounded awesome. this tension and it was, uh, it was just, it was just in incredible to work on. It was just a great experience. I love getting into the nitty gritty and, 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 and getting imaginative with the, with the, the little tiny details, like, like almost like there was a heat source generating because we know Tarkus was born in the volcano, which you see in the background. So, you know, you see this lava infused treads as he comes rumbling uh, across these, this, this, uh, this surreal plane that could be another planet. We don't know where that world of Tarkus is, but the music was always otherworldly. Well, the the lion looking dude with the stinger, I think I got that as a prize at Lucky Charms one. I could be mistaken, but I, <laughs> the I, I, I feel like I did. <laughs> well, listen, okay. man, uh, Jerry, really great work. It's crazy that you get to do that. Do you make a living? Do they pay you money for this? Uh, I Well, yeah, thankfully, uh, I, I have been for, for a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I was, ha you know, I was happy to to contribute to this effort because Keith Emerson meant so much to me. I mean, he's really, he was really the one that, that inspired me uh, to be an artist and to be my best. I mean, the well, music was kind of constant. Uh, take, 
Uh, take a look at this. Uh, Benia is going to show us because uh, Jerry and Mark worked together on this package. Uh, the artwork doesn't stop with just what you saw. It's inside and outside the DVD package, which we're going to be telling you exactly how you can get this. Uh, Mark, discuss this DVD packaging and exactly how it came together with you and Jerry. Well, uh, what you got here is you've got the, the original cover here that expands here. It kind of unfolds, kind of like the music does. On the outside, and then on the inside is this, this great lava that you have going here, and you've got all your credits, uh, so you know what you're listening to. And then we, it blows open to quite a, if I can get everything in there, there, that's the entire thing there. You've got the Tarkus egg over here, which is uh, where Tarkus was born from, and then you have the volcano from the aerial point of view with two DVDs and two CDs. Uh, that have a great uh, ambience in the back that uh, Jerry created. And then you've got the, the book that's inside that has a, an un, uh, unhindered version of the Tarkus battle. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, and it all folds up like this. You can get it in your glove compartment, you yeah. know, in your car. So it's... Mark, listen, buddy, you know I love you, but uh, I need to uh, help you on something because if, if the music thing goes by the wayside, you may need to get a job. Um, and I'm thinking Home Shopping Network. So as I tell people <laughs> where they can go to get the DVD, I want you to open that thing back up okay. and hold it. But you've got to put your hand under it and do it back and forth like the like the person does on the Home Shopping Network. So you do that okay. while I tell people where you can get this incredible concert that took place several years ago. You can hear every note by the finest players working today by going to cherryred.co.uk. <laughs> Don't forget the hat. Perfect. Uh, you go to cherryred. Do it more, Mark. More back and forth. Cherryred.co.uk. Type in Keith Emerson. And it will be yours. And Mark worked his ass off to find a company that wouldn't take a cut. All of this money is going to help with this devastating disease that Keith suffered from. Uh, Mark, listen, buddy, I, I think maybe you need to make sure the musician thing works for you. I don't think the uh, Home Shopping Network <laughs> is going to because most of them don't giggle through it. Well, uh, I was uh, I was only using my musician career as a stepping stone <laughs> to the Home Shopping Network. So I'm, I'll stick with the music for a while. Uh, yeah. All right. So now we're going to show you we've talked about the package and the concert. and We're going to show you clips, pieces of what you're going to see in this incredible show. And uh, Benia is going to help me with some of these names. But you are going to hear from the following people throughout this next two hours. Uh, Rachel Flowers, Steve Picaro, Brian and Karma Auger, uh, Greg Bissonette. Why is he here, Mark? Why is Bissonette involved in this show? <laughs> okay. Uh, C.J. Vanston. Yep. Jonathan Sindelman. Troy Lucetta. Philip yeah. Sacey. Sice. Sice, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Mike Wallace. Mick Mahan. Travis Davis. Ed Roth. I know the great skunk Baxter. Aaron Emerson, uh, Tadahi Mickelson, Jordan Rudis, <laughs> Joe Travers, Swing Steve this. Lukather, and Benia promised me at the end I could ask one question of Luke. I've got one. I bet you do. If he answers it proper, if he answers it properly, it'll be the single greatest <laughs> story that you've ever heard. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Uh, we've talked about the show. Uh, Benia shared with me the fact that, you know, musicians, sadly, are going through a really tough time right now. And that's something we could probably get into at a different time. But Mark said that because everybody came together for the same reason, which was love and passion of not only the man, but the music, that it was an incredible night where everybody was just on their game because they wanted to be. This wasn't a paycheck. This was a love letter. And we're going to give you clips throughout uh, of, of the DVD that we're inviting you to spend your money on. And please know the money that you do spend doesn't go to a CEO's pocket. It goes to charity, all of it. Benita made sure of that. 
Uh, here is clip number one. It is The Barbarian. I mean, why waste time? Let's welcome in a couple of the guys that you just saw in that clip. Joining us now is Steve Picaro and Greg Bissonnette. Good day, gentlemen. Hey there. There we Mark. are. Yes. Mark. Um, hey, Mark. Now, Mark's uh, a drummer. Yeah. A lot of people might not know this, but Mark's a drummer, and I've played double drums with him, doggone it. Yeah, but, uh, Greg, dude, you can't even cl classify me as a drummer when sure. we just witnessed <laughs> what, you, what you do. And your son's um, a great drummer. Yes, he is. Well, you're... You're, you're kind. Thank you, fellas. Much appreciated. So now, uh, guys, this, this, as I said, was a, a, a passion, a love to get up. And Steve, boy, I don't know how a keyboard survives you beating the hell out of it like you were just doing there. <laughs> well, you've seen Keith. He was my inspiration. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, um, so talk about that, Steve. I mean, we really haven't gotten into the influence that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer had back in the early, early first time you heard it. Think because nobody was doing that. Yeah. Um, my brothers took me in 1971 to the Hollywood Bowl to see uh, Edgar Winters' right, White Trash. That's what we were way in R&B. And uh, Humble Pie played after them. And then... Uh, ELP took the stage. I had no idea what I was going to see. And uh, Barbarian was the song that opened up the concert. And uh, it just hit me at 14 years old like a ton of bricks. Wow. Um, Keith was just amazing. And uh, he that night became my hero. He was the rock star for me. He was my Hendrix. And, and and Steve, try to put it into words if you can, because again, as I said, nobody was doing this. This was brand new. This was fresh. This was the first time anybody had seen or witnessed that vibe. What did it do to you? Uh, again, it just uh, it killed me. I I had never seen the nice. I had no idea what to expect. You know, their song on the radio was "Lucky Man." Um, it just was life changing. That's the only way I could put it. Mm -hmm. It was completely life-changing for me. Um, and it wasn't just the visuals and Keith's energy and the show they put on, which I had never seen a keyboard player do that. It was this music, this, uh, um, uh, it was heroic. It was yep. the way they incorporated classical stuff like, like uh, uh, Allegro Barbero and all this other stuff. And then they did Tarkas that night. And uh, I just had never heard anything like this. Uh, it just hit me on a very, very deep level. And um, he, was, he became my hero that night. I'll never forget it. Now, Greg, uh, obviously you were affected in much the same way. And then you had a chance to play with Keith at, I think, NAM in 1997. 
Yeah, Mark, what a blast that was. I mean, growing up in Detroit, uh, we are all big hockey fans. Detroit hockey, when you watch the Detroit hockey commercial, you heard, he shoots, he scores. And so, I mean, we grew up loving Emerson, Lake and Palmer. My brother and I, Matt, a great bass player, Bob Birch, who oh, yeah. played with us, with, with Keith, with Mark. Anyway, great bass player who we lost a few years ago. Played on a lot of the Christmas shows. Anyway, we all grew up just loving Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And Carl, too, as a drummer, man, I was really into Buddy Rich and Ringo. Mm -hmm. And Carl was like Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, double bass with a brrrr. And if you would have told me I would have gotten to play the first song with Mark singing, Welcome back, my friend, <laughs> on that wonderful concert when I was a kid, I wouldn't have believed it. But we did the rehearsal. Mark, was it center staging? Third yeah, it was center court? staging. At yeah, center yeah, staging. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, growing up uh, in Detroit, I always played gigs with my dad's band. He had a, a wedding band. And if a comedian came up and he tripped and he fell, you went bloop when he fell, right? <laughs> Maynard Ferguson would drop a napkin, a, a white hanky, and as soon as it hit the ground, you'd start playing Arigen. So the napkin would go, and when he hit the ground, you'd go, and just swing as fast as you could. So Keith's talking about his cue. And we're rehearsing, and I've got these charts that are just, I'm trying to learn all these songs, and they're wrapped around my toms. Yeah. And he says, so, so when I jump, is when I want you to really hit that downbeat and we'll start going. So Keith jumps and he jumps and he comes down and I go, dum, 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 dum. and he goes, no, 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 mate, when I jump and he, okay, let's try it again. And he jumps again. And when he comes down, I start playing. He goes, no, when I jump, there, I want you to start. <laughs> you want me to start when you go up. Like a conductor. You're like, okay, that's usually like, and now we're on the. Yeah. So anyway, we laughed so hard about that. For a while, he couldn't get that I wanted to have him hit the ground. Yeah. yeah, you got it, yeah, Mark. Yeah, you yeah, were yeah. laughing away. But we, we then laughed about it a lot, and we laughed about it for I years I just remember how stressed you were, because I called it, look, Joe Travers was supposed to do this show, right? And Joe got down, he got caught, caught with a flu, right? So I called Biss the night before going, hey, I need to, are you free? <laughs> well, no, I got other things committed with them. No, 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 this is at night. Oh, I can do it. Good. You're playing Tarkus. You're like, huh? <laughs> you know, and, and so but I already got him to say he was free. So he couldn't back out. So he was all night. I remember talking to Bud about it, your dad, yeah. talking about like, he was up all night charting this thing, stressing out <laughs> majorly yeah. to have to play that monstrosity by sight. By yeah, sight. Yeah, you're my hero, pal. Well, I've never, I've, there was no way I could have done that gig wow. had oh. I done it like you did it. Well, now. you are oh. the king of memorizing. I got a great memory, but it's short, Mark. So I, I like to write little cues out and stuff, mm -hmm. but I, I literally had like a six-page chart because yeah. how do you memorize you overnight Tarkus? No. I mean, the right way, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. so... You want to play it the right way, and Amazing. we sure had well, a ball. Didn't um, we? we did, baby. Thanks for asking that we've question, Mark. To, uh, we, you bet. And we, we've got to move along, but I wanted you to know, obviously, Steve Piccaro, everybody knows. Greg Bissonette, this gentleman who just told the story, this guy is the go-to drummer. Oh. Uh, if you want – it's true, Greg. Shut up. If you want <laughs> the best, you hire him. Get this. Uh, Benia might have been there. I went to see ELO the Electric Light Orchestra at CBS a decade ago. And who's on drums? Oh. This idiot right here. And he <laughs> screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> he still had his uh, carcass chart. That was yeah, a problem. Was, oh, shit. Don't bring the guy to Don't bring the uh, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. Well, I think I think both of these fellas here have had history on the Mark and Brian Christmas show. Steve, Greg, thank you for the time and thank you for for the passion you put into this concert. The absolute best. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, My gentlemen. pleasure. All both right. Marks. Yeah, uh, baby. We'll tell you where you can get the DVD again in just a minute because that's what we're about. The clip we just saw, the two fellas we just talked to. We've got a bunch more. The DVD is for sale. It is completely 100% for charity. And when we come back from this next clip, I'm going to tell you where you can get a copy of the DVD for yourself. But right now, let's take a look at another clip of something that you're going to see and hear and witness when you own your very own copy. This is Endless Enigma.
Rachel, that was absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to, yeah. And so talk a little bit about Keith and the way that he used jazz fusion in his composition and how you pulled from that. Mm. Yeah, Keith was pretty cool. Like, um, I remember when I was nine years old, I was playing some classical music by composers, some Bach, some Debussy, and this uh, one of my one of my mom and dad's friends, McRae, played me um, the uh, trilogy album. And when it got to the Endless Enigma fugue, I was like, "Wow!" So he's you can do like sort of the Bach fugues and. But I, at the time, I had no idea who it was. I was just like, what is this? But I couldn't verbalize it yet. <laughs> and then I heard Trilogy with the synthesizers, and I was like, what, what's, what is that sound? Because, like, really cool. And then once I started to get into the discography of ELP and then make videos on YouTube of myself playing the repertoire, um, it's pretty cool how Keith was one of those composers who would take cues from a lot of classical composers from Bach with the fugues. Um, I'm thinking of, of um, not just Bach, but the uh, contemporary composers. And that was one of the things that I got from Keith was just the diversity in, in his compositions. He had like the Bach thing and then with with the organ, like especially in his early days with the nice, that was when some of my favorite jazz organists I started getting into really came from listening to Keith and um, specifically players like Jimmy Smith, Jack McDuff, um, the way that he got the distortion on the Hammond organ and then like the spring reverb thing that he was doing i think he got that from I, I can't remember his name don something he was like a he uh, did a really cool adaptation of a greek piece um but anyway so when i got to meet keith emerson it was like one of those pretty cool experiences and i remember the last conversation i had with him it was at the nam show in 2016 and uh I remember I was in a pretty grumpy mood that night because <laughs> like I wanted I wanted to like lie down because it was all like crazy so and then I hear this voice is like hello darling <laughs> I was like hey Keith how are you doing <laughs> so now uh, Rachel if I were to grab your iPod <laughs> you know you're this great jazz pianist and, I, and if I were to grab your iPod and look what song or music would I find that I would be shot something like Hanson Mbop what do you what is your guilty pleasure musically oh there all there's a whole bunch um lots of stuff Lauren Hill Erica Badu D'Angelo um Kendrick Lamar um Osmonds yeah, a whole lots of stuff. <laughs> Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, The Roots, Jay Dilla, uh, a lot of hip hop stuff. Some, some, uh, uh, I don't know. It's just like always evolving. Jacob Collier is another one. Um, Taylor Ixty, some like jazz pianists. Uh, Robert Glasper. Um, for flute players, it'll be like, I don't really know, just good stuff. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> also, also joining us is, is Troy Lucetta. Hi, Troy. And this guy, as we look at him, uh, not only is he a great drummer, I also I wonder how it is he wound up in Mongolia, but he wound up there playing with a full orchestra uh, as he gave us uh, Endless Enigma. Uh, Troy, thank you for joining and tell us about that experience. Um, well, I was originally slated to go with Mark to Mongolia and what happened was I, uh, Tony Pia who was the drummer at the time before myself I think he had taken on the Doobie Brothers and he started playing with the Doobie so he, he was kind of out of the picture and Mark had called me and asked me about going to Mongolia and and I thought like wow 
I mean, this is a complete fish out of water experience for me because as most of you know, I'm a rock and roll drummer. And, um, and, and I have to say, you know, I, I, I wasn't familiar with a lot of the music and the stuff that we were doing. But Mark had called me and asked me to do it. And I said, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, I'm sure. And I'm like, okay. So my, my whole model in life is just show up. And that's kind of what I do. So, uh, but at any rate, after I hung up the phone, I realized, I thought, what the heck did I just sign up for? And um, as it would turn out, he called me back and I was really starting to lose sleep over this thing, man. I was like, shit, I think I bit off something a little too big here, right? And uh, so what happened was he called me back, I don't know, it was about two weeks into it, a week later, and I was starting to lose a little bit of sleep over this thing. And uh, he says, I got some really bad news and I'm really sorry. And he says, uh, they don't have the budget for um, yourself. Are we still good? I know I dropped my mic. Okay. Um, my pack fell off. But uh, anyway, so I was really relieved at that point. They didn't have the budget for myself and Travis, the bass player. So um, a little bit of time had passed, and I think a couple weeks later, you know, I, I, I was getting sleep again, so everything was great. And the next thing I know, I get a call from Mark in China, and he says, hey, how are you doing? I says, I'm doing fantastic. What are you doing? How's things going? What's going on at home? I start to fill him in a little bit, and uh, he says, what are you doing next week? And I said, I got nothing really going. Good, I need you here in Mongolia. <laughs> it's not working out with these guys. And I was like... So basically, I had, uh, I think, about five, six days to uh, just jump in the studio and start preparing for what was getting ready to happen. And, um, and yeah, and this was a life-changing moment for me, uh, becoming a part of this. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the shorter story. Uh, and as we went from Mongolia, after we finished the Mongolia experience, which went well, and I did do a little crash and burn through there, but we don't have to get into that. But, um, and then I was asked to go to Germany and record with Keith, the Three Fates. Um, and, and at that point, I was just, just so floored and blown away the fact that I would get, go spend the next, you know, uh, two weeks with Keith and Mark and, and Travis and all of us, you know, and sharing the same house and getting to know Keith and, the irony of all of it back in 04, the Scorpions, Tesla and Keith Emerson toured together. So I got to know Keith on a little bit of a personal level. But, you know, the one thing I can tell you about Keith is the guy was the most perfect gentleman. And uh, the fact that I got to play such a smart part in this huge picture and, and be a part of this was just truly the greatest moment I've ever had in music, for sure. Well. Troy, I'm sure you can understand when I say this because Benia called me too. And he said, dude, I want you to go to Mongolia with me. And I said, I'm not going to Mongolia with you, you freak. Oh, Troy. <laughs> there you well, go. Listen, guys, thank you so much for your time and being a part of this. Uh, this uh, concert that we've been talking about is available to you from cherryred.co.uk. Type in Keith Emerson. All of the money, all of the money goes to charity. Rachel, Troy, thank you so much for coming by You're and welcome. being a part of this wonderful thing. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, let's move to another clip. If you go to that website, cherryred.co.uk, and you buy the DVD, here is another clip of what you're going to have in your possession. This is Take a Pebble.
Wow. Good Lord. We are welcomed now by the gentleman you just saw playing the piano, C.J. Vanston, uh, and the idiot Travis Davis. Uh, (laughs) uh, C.J., now it looked to me when I was watching you play, it looked to me like you've played before. I was wondering if you had professional training or did you do the Mr. Rogers Big Note songbook? (laughs) Well, uh, you know, my father was a jazz piano player, so I grew up... uh, uh, above the stage of the club that he played in. So I, I listened to him a lot, and I saw a lot of things. I remember uh, the jazz guys would come upstairs. I was about four years old, and I knew they were supposed to be heavy-duty guys and really cool, but I thought, if these guys are so cool, why do they have to share a cigarette? <laughs> why can't they afford their own cigarette? You know, What's it was that? a big lie. The whole thing was a big lie. So I know you it was see a that area the is covered in the Mister Rogers Big Note Songbook. <laughs> yeah. It's all right there. <laughs> it's all uh, right to, there to be, to be, dude. That is really. You know what? If I could do that, what I just saw you doing, I would never leave the house. That's I don't. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> but you would still play drums. I hope, Mark. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, boy, that's that's no, he's insane. Amazing. Nuts. Well, you know what's so, cool about he, it is. Uh, uh, that's not the piece the way it is on the record uh, intact. We just went off on a, a thing in the middle of it and just went on this improv. We hope you enjoy wow. our new direction. Yeah, our new direction. <laughs> We're yeah. Jazz Odyssey. Jazz Odyssey, yeah. yeah. Well, well, maybe that was because I couldn't afford my own cigarette. Maybe that was. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we kind of took off and went on a, on a tangent that we was really We were listening good. to yeah, each well, other. Well, yeah, and these guys listen so well. And, I mean, it, uh, yeah. Huh? 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 <laughs> We love to listen to each other, Mark, and just improvise the old school thing. Like, let's just play. We don't know. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to follow our ringleader here, CJ, and just Travis and I were just, you know, loving what CJ was was throwing out there, man. Yeah, tightrope. Well, now, Greg. No, not. uh, Greg, this is really unique for you because I've seen you play a lot. And most of the time, and I guess it would depend on the scenario, but you're reading when you're playing. You're but But in this... You also obviously have the ability to just riff on something. So that had to be fun for you, Greg. Oh, yeah. Like for the Christmas shows and all the shows we did, we'd have so many acts that you would, you and Mark would put together that I would have, you know, 10 different charts for 10 different things. But there's a section in here that says CJ Solo. And Travis and I just go, jink, because this guy here is one of the greatest ever. And when he sits down and plays, my dad used to have a line. He'd say, CJ. I like the way you carry yourself. And he sits on the piano, and you just know things are going to happen. So we're both zooming in, and things happen rhythmically, fives and sevens and offbeat patterns. And it was kind of like Miles and and, and, and that era, you know, Herbie Hancock, Tony Williams, Ron Carter kind of thing that we grew up with. So, yeah, yeah it's all improvising. Yeah, a lot of that in there, for sure. Yeah. A lot of those influences, which were a lot of Keats' influences, you know. Miles? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do all that. Doug, so. give me a give me a close up shot of Travis, if you would. I've I've worked with Travis on many occasions in some most unique and very interesting yes. uh, shows, and his face never changes. <laughs> no matter the house could be on fire, and it, it, Doug, give me a close up of Travis. The house could be on fire. And he would look like this right here. It says Cindy Crawford cream, I think. The house is on fire. Doesn't matter. Know. Hopefully your water hey, um, uh, Travis, I, I have been around you for a lot of time, and it's obvious you're one of the go-tos. Uh, talk a little bit about when you first heard Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and what that did for you as a musician. My parents were really into all types of music, and I remember starting off as an orchestral musician and then getting into upright bass and then progressing into electric bass and asking them what bands had good bass players. Mm. And they were like, well, you've got Guess, you've got Rush, you've got Weather Report, you've got King Crimson, you've got ELP. And I was just going down the list and listening to all this stuff. And I listened to ELP. And the first song, I, the first album I heard was uh, Brain Sound Surgery. And being blown away by that and learning to play the whole album by memory 
and then moving on to Tarkus, and then you're lucky if something you listen to opens another door. Mm. But when I listened to Keith, it was like I was put in a hallway of doors. Okay, so and so wow. played this, and he played with this guy. So let's listen to what they did. So and so played wow. with this guy, and let's listen to what they did. And it just wormhole. Yeah, it was a wormhole. <laughs> before a wormhole. Yeah. before YouTube. <laughs> yeah, way before YouTube, because they had parents well, had a massive vinyl collection, so I was just pulling wow. stuff out. And, well, I, I I think the first time I was around. Uh, Travis, uh, I was staring at him. He was on stage looking like that. And and I was kind of staring at him. And he saw me staring at him and he walked over to me. And he said, listen, man, I know what you're thinking, but let me just tell you, chicks dig the ball dudes. <laughs> and who am I to correct him? Who am I to correct him? I'm no one. So I didn't. I just love that um, he's, he's the calm, cute, cool, cool guy, man. Mark, you'll see him, and he's just there. He's the same way right now when he's under pressure, and he's just like, give it to me. Right. Whatever you got, and he plays it, yeah. and he nails it, and he sings it. Cool hand Luke right here. You got to do what you got to do. got to do it. You got to do what you got to do. Well, I mean, chicks dig the boulder. They dig the trap. Uh, gentlemen, uh, CJ, Greg, and Travis, thank you so much for not only your passion so and your time, but for doing this great thing. Thank you for coming down. It's great to see you. Thank you, Mark. Very welcome. Good to be here uh, with you guys. All right, so after we finish this next segment, I'll tell you how you can get this DVD of this incredible concert that's going on. If you do buy the DVD, which, by the way, is 100% for charity, you're going to get this piece right here. This is called Tank. That's just a clip, a piece, uh, a segment of the DVD that you can own. The money that you spend goes to completely goes to charity. All you do to get this DVD is go to cherryred.co.uk. Type in Keith Emerson and order your DVD. Three of the gentlemen that just were on stage for that piece is joining us now. Uh, drummer Joe Travers, bass player Mick Mahan, and keyboards Jonathan Sindelman. Good day, gentlemen. So, Jonathan, it says here, and I got to know, first of all, I think the smallest room I've seen is the baked potato. And you had a chance to play Tarkas while Keith was there. That's right. Um, in fact, um, it was Joe Travers that called me up. Um, 
and he had been meeting with uh, Mark Benilla and Mike Keneally and decided to plan a, a concert that revolved around a lot of different music. But the anchor in all of this was uh, Tarkas. And, you know, Joe knew that we had a mutual uh, passion for not just that particular piece, but the, the era. To relive this was great. Um, and so I said, sure, I'll do it. And I hung up the phone. And of course, after I hung up the phone, I said, what did I just do? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but some, you know, sometimes you just know that it's, this is a good thing. It needs to happen. It's going to happen. And it was actually a hybrid of the Keith Emerson band and the Mike Keneally band on the same stage. Um, and I was kind of in that, in the center of it. Um, so, uh, I didn't know that Keith was going to be there. So there was really no time to react. Um, and, you know, what, what one can say about Tarkas is uh, you have that slow build up. You're building up the soundscape tone by tone, almost like lighting candles on a candelabra. And before you know it, you've stepped through the Stargate and there's no turning back. You kind <clears> of, <throat> you know, you go, you go almost out of your body. And uh, I think that was the perfect piece because it, had it been any other piece, and I knew Keith was in the audience, I'm, it might not have been the best thing for me to think about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we went ahead, and it was a, a very memorable experience, and got done doing it. And um, after the show, you know, you're hanging with, with people and all that. And um, I'd had a few words with Keith before the show. Um, but then we were, you know, I was over at the bar, and he came up to me, and he, he just said... Uh, Jonathan, you know, your rendition, your interludes. I, I'm sitting, listening to you the whole time, and I, I was saying to myself, F, you know, expletive. Right. Why didn't I think of that? And, <laughs> and not only was this, you know, like so many, for so many other people, my, my hero, um, Tarkas was the album on my wall when I was 14 years old. I mean, that, that thing was on my wall. It must have been sending, sending signals in a deep space. Uh, could have never known all those years later. And similar to Stevie Picaro, like, Barbarian was the first piece that, you know, instantly changed everything. But, but Tarkas was, you know, uh, it just became that, that centerpiece. Um, so at the end of the night, you know, that fast forward to the end of the evening, we stayed a little bit late, had a couple of drinks and, and uh, you know, getting ready to leave. And he opens up, Keith opens up the uh, front breast pocket of his jacket and takes out, unfolds this piece of paper, and it's, it's the first page from Tarkas, the music. Wow. And, wow. and he signs it and dedicates it to me. Wow. And, uh, and all I got to tell you is, you know, that was, doesn't seem like a long time ago, but you can't really measure these moments in time because uh, that music is timeless, and it, and it catches up to you. And getting together with all these people, it's like, Really, what a little bit of time and distance does is the music lives on forever, but his legacy just as much is the people. And, and it's the reason we're all together and we're all standing here together is because of him and the relationships that have, that even though we were going to go to Japan, we were going to do a tour, didn't happen, obviously. Um, that wasn't really the loss. We gain so much from him to this day. And I will always be cherishing his story through the lives uh, that are us and music. Um, so it'll never be lost on me, that, that moment in time with Keith. Um, uh, so, good, yeah. good stuff, Jonathan. Um, so Joe, Mick, we've talked about Emerson, Lake and Palmer and the effect that this had. It was maybe the first, pro well, I guess it was the first progressive rock most people heard. Would each of you individually talk about how it affected you and what your thoughts were when you heard this kind of music for the first time? Uh, why don't we start with you, Joe? I want to say that that's the first time that I've seen that clip from Tank since it, since we performed it, and I'm so excited that it's that it's actually going to be out now. I'm, I'm, it was such a special night, and um, you know, I have unbelievable memories of that evening, and uh, I also have of course, unbelievable memories of being with Keith. But, um, you know, throughout my years of 
coming across music, uh, a cassette of the first, uh, the self-titled album with Tank and Lucky Man and the Barbarian and all that came into my life. I was probably about 12 years old. And um, drum solos, recorded drum solos, like on live albums, uh, was like my drum lessons when I was a kid. That's how I was learning. And when I heard Tank, it was like, <laughs> you can imagine hearing that song for the first time and being a young drummer, you know? It was just, it was like, it was a whole thing. It was amazing. And uh, to get the opportunity to play that uh, in this concert was, a, was really a truth, seriously. Well, it was a, it was amazing work that you did uh, there, and Mick, you the same. Uh, your Thank thoughts you. on the music of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, how it affected you? Well, it's not unlike the rest of the guys here. You know, I mean, it was such a life-changing event just to hear that stuff. And, uh, of course, along your musical journey, if you're a rock musician or whatever you are, then you start to hear this kind of music, and it's a, it's a point of departure where you really just go, you know, I got to step up my game or whatever. It's, it becomes more intellectual and, and a cerebral experience, but um, nonetheless, heartfelt at the same time. So it's still rocking, but the, the, you know, what, the equipment that it takes to pull that off is a whole different level of musicianship. And so it makes you change your game for the better. Well, the good news is the, the evening that these gentlemen, and you just heard Joe talk about it, how how fortunate he feels this music is finally going to be available it is the yeah. full entire very special night is available on dvd you can get your copy right now uh cherry red go to cherry uk. you type in keith emerson every single penny of the money you spend goes to charity that is a promise uh, Joe, Mick, Jonathan, thank you so much, not only for the concert, but for your time here today. You've done a wonderfully great thing. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think it's great that there is a, a, a piece of music from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer that's the exact same name as a girl I once dated. Please welcome now the clip from Rondo a la Blue Turkey. Very nice. And before we talk to the gentleman you just saw play, we did get a call from the company. And this is actually an important piece of information. Those of you that, that like me, like an idiot, you go to Amazon, you order a, a Blu-ray or a DVD and you get it. And it doesn't play in the region that you're in. I don't look at the fine print. I paid 
way too much and it won't play. Um, the DVD of this concert plays in all regions around the world. It doesn't matter. They've had a lot of calls about this and questions about this. So when you purchase from cherryred.co.uk, type in Keith Emerson, the DVD you get plays in all regions. Uh, we welcome in now the gentleman that you just saw perform, Brian Auger and Karma Auger. Good day, gentlemen. What's How up, doing? Mark? How are you? How are you? You boys just tore that up. Nasty, <laughs> nasty work, Brian. Well, it's, you know, it's amazing because uh, when I was in London and, and at the beginning of my recording career, I was uh, working in AdVision Studios with a, a young guy, a young, young guy who was uh, Eddie Offord. And Eddie had this, actually, what was Keith's. Um, it, I had never seen one before, actually. It was just like blocks of, of different things and knobs and God knows what. So he said, you wanna, I said, what the hell is that? And he said, oh, Keith, it's, uh, just put something down. You wanna have, you wanna hear it? So I said, of course. And it was Tank. <laughs> so here we are, several centuries later, and here I am listening, listening to, and even then uh, when, I, when I first was asked to, uh, uh, to come to the concert and, uh, you know, I mean, Keith was my best buddy at that point. We both mm. came from the same kind of area, except he came from the kind of classical side of things. I came out of the jazz side in, in uh, London. And so um, there it was. It's a kind of mix and match of everything. Um, anyway, um, when I when I heard this thing, I you know I thought, whoa, that's amazing, it, and, it, and it is actually after all this time, you know, are the uh, all these synthesizers and things have you know just advanced, uh, and uh, I don't know, you know, I I uh, I met Keith uh, through the Korg people, and. Um, we just hit it off, actually. I had really never had time to kind of sit down with him and get to know him, but we laughed like lunatics. Um, and, uh, and so that's how it, my, you know, it all, all kind of started off like that with Keith. And uh, in the meantime, I had heard him play and I realized that this guy was like totally different to the way I play. If I come from the jazz side, so I'm, I'm you know, listening to all the Miles Davis uh, piano players and, uh, you know, and Coltrane's guys and stuff like that. Uh, and um, he's coming, you know, <laughs> out of all sorts of different places, but something really new. Um, so there we are. I, I, uh, I thought, well, uh, when, when I was asked to play on the, uh, on the concert, uh, I spoke to Mari and I, I, I said to her, look, I'm, I'm going to be really, you know, stick out like a sore thumb. And the reason is, you know, my, my style is so different to Keith's. Um, so um, I don't know whether I would fit or whether it's worth doing this. He said, no, no, says Mari. No, no, you've got to play. You've got to play. So I said, all right, I'll have to actually write something for Keith. Now, Keith, I know, was uh, a big fan of... Uh, um, Dave Brubeck, and he liked this tune he told me about. It was um, uh, from a, 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 an album that, uh, that Dave had made, and all different time signatures. And um, the Blue Rondo a la Turk, I think, was uh, uh, the tune that he was talking about. So it starts off with a quite sort of a, in 9 8, you know. And so I thought, well, what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, just um, I know I know Keith would love this, so I did that, and then I switched it into four four. And on we went, and because his his signature tune had really become. 
um, you know, the, the uh, fanfare for the common man. Mm. Um, anyway, when I put this thing together and, uh, you know, finally, I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to call this. I think I should call it fanfare for the common blue turkey. And <laughs> that's it. That was it. Um, so karma, karma. Was, karma played on it, too. Uh, Karma, let, let's get into this because I, I think every musician knows and anybody <laughs> who listens to music knows that every musician borrows from whatever and whoever they hear. Was there any influences that came your way and influenced your drumming from Emerson, Lake and Palmer? Sure, absolutely. Um, um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that uh, Keith talked about also, and uh, is a story that I want to share was, so there was a dinner one evening with uh, Steve Picaro as well, who yes. was here also, yeah. and uh, a couple guys from Korg and my father, and Keith, and uh, Mari was there as well. And we all got together, it was during a NAMM show, which is the big music convention in town. And Keith and Brian had never really sat down and talked a whole bunch, but they got, they got together and they got to talking. And what we very, soon realized is here are these two pioneers in their own way of uh, music, keyboard playing, uh, you know, giants. And once they started talking, what we realized was so many of their influences were the same people. <laughs> and so wow. it's, yeah. it blows my mind how um, we, can, we can have two completely different versions and, and kind of um, Style. experiences yeah, and yeah. styles and people who come and yet they've all listened to the same people i i just love that about music yeah it, it is very very cool <laughs> and guys it's obvious your talent shines through very kind of you to not only be there on that night but to be here today to help us hopefully do a good thing thank you for your time and thank you for your talent thank both you, of you so much it's a great uh, pleasure we love keith and we're so excited to be here that's right nice yeah. thank you fellas uh, to get a copy, go to cherryred.co.uk. Type in Keith Emerson. Every single dollar goes to charity, not some CEO's pocket. Now, uh, what you're watching is a, a show put together by people that were influenced and loved Keith Emerson and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. There was a concert that took place a couple of three years ago. Uh, that all of the best players in the business today came together for free to do this show in tribute uh, of this gentleman and of that music, groundbreaking progressive rock. Um, the DVD, Bonilla worked for years to find a company that would release it without taking a piece. And it took years to do it. Everybody's about how much do we get? How much do I get? Which, by the way, how much do I get? Uh, we finally found a company, I, I say we, Benia found a company that would do this for charity. Every single penny you spend goes to charity. You go to cherryred.co.uk, type in Keith Emerson, and we just heard from the people uh, with Cherry Red. The DVD that you receive will play in all regions. And if anybody wants to buy any DVDs and Blu-rays that play in Mongolia only, I've got about 30. And I'll sell those to you cheap. So just let me know, and I'll unload that to you for, you know, half the price that I pay. Uh, all right, so we will load that up. Right now, a gentleman that I've spent my entire radio career working beside, alongside, under, and happily so. The great the wonderful Uncle Joe Benson. Joey, how we doing? My God, you're the best ever. Same, it just is better and better and better and better and better and better. <laughs> if only you could remember you what lie. it was you did. If you remember what you remember, <laughs> you got to have it. I've known this guy since he was very, very far away. But boy, this is just something you got going down here tonight. This is one of the Good coolest stuff. concert situations I've ever been. I've, we figure out since I've been on the air since uh, 68, I've been busy all that time. You notice that, Mark? I've been busy the entire time. I got a job all the time. It always happens. But just the same, the music comes through like this. And I've run into, I've done at least a thousand intros of, you know, of every guest for the last many years and all that kind of stuff. But this was a very unique one in that 
The musicians are absolutely top notch. These are the best there are, and it's astounding how blazing. You can't even imagine how fast some of these things are going. You got uh, Skunk Baxter there as well, and Luca Thur, and some other creatures of the night as well. But all this stuff is going on, and you look at the crowd, you look at the audience. The audience is numbed out because it's just so so much stuff going on, and the, and the, the musicians are focusing on exactly on what has been going on for this stuff. What is the music? Is everything in here, and it's even bigger because of the way it was been done, the way it's been shot, and all that. And I'm real lucky to have a guy with us here tonight who knows a little bit about the family. I guess I could say that. Aaron Emerson is with us. And Aaron, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of what we're doing here again this year. And uh, it's same. I, I assume for you it's the same thing. It's almost overwhelming to see the response of the audience coming in your direction, saying like giving you credit for being, you know, like like you and I had anything to do with it in the first place. It's just the same. The, qual the quality of the music and the putting and all that on. It, did it surprise you? Surprise you that what strength there was to begin with? Yeah, well, I mean, now I know what my dad was doing when he went away for all this time. <laughs> <laughs> when, 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 when did he? All this time he went away. I was just thinking he was like going on holiday. Now I realize, oh, he's actually playing the piano. Okay. The, yes, yes, so to speak. When did when did uh, were, did you become aware that maybe uh, your dad was different than anybody else because he had fans and stuff, people always trying Long to... Long hair. Long hair, that was the yeah. difference? Yeah, uh, the clothes, definitely the clothes. Uh, uh, the, the shiny stuff. But no, I, there, there was... The, 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 the earliest moment that I remember was... There was a big gig, it might have been 1977, at the uh, Montreal Stadium, maybe, but the, we, we were leaving, and the, we were in the in the, the limo, and we were taking off, and everyone was banging on the windows, and uh, I thought, "Damn, Dad, something you've really pissed people off. Something's really got. <laughs> they don't like you at all. We, yeah. What have you done? You know, I, I don't think I can pay. I, I I don't know what we were doing. I think." Because we were backstage, I think we just left and we were in the car, and I thought he must have, uh, you know, uh, uh, things gone bad. So everyone was banging on the car, and we left. I didn't understand. But since uh, then. That <laughs> the tribute concert, you were there uh, five years ago, I think it was when we were doing that. The song "Ride" was came up while we were talking about things going on in the music. The song "Ride," where do you fit into that? What did you what, what did you come up with it? Made it up just before I came on stage. Literally, just came to me. Uh, no, I'm uh, it was it was the song that I did. One of the first ever songs I ever did uh, with with a with a singer, a songwriter called Gary O'Brien. Um, and I was in a band called Don, and we were doing something together. And uh, he named the song "Ride," and he had lyrics. But we, the band, we we drifted off, and I elaborated on the tune i made it into instrumental um and dad liked it it was one of the songs that he did like it was one of the earliest songs it was sentimental to us uh -huh. i played it at, i played it at his uh, funeral uh, as a uh, uh, and it was just something close to uh, uh, you know special song to us <laughs> I also heard uh, rumors here that uh, there's maybe a new recording of uh, Lucky Man. Have you been part of anything to do with that so far? Yeah, so um, I've always loved the song, and I love the history of the song. I love uh, Greg Lake's, uh, you know, work uh, or, or his voice. And uh, so last year we were thinking, uh, I got together with a, a friend of mine, uh, Brett, uh, Copeland and we, we, but we didn't work that out together. But we got the musicians together, and uh, we got the acoustic guitar of Matt Fuller, lead guitar Mark Vanilla, bass Chuck White, yeah. drums Zach Sexton, and, and Nathan Jake singing. And we got the move thanks to uh, uh, Vince uh, Papilla and Emiat. We got the original move at the end, and it, we've got a little twist on it. But it, it sounds really big and epic, and uh, I think it sounds great. Thank you so, so much. It was a joy. Good. Looking forward to playing around some more. We got more happening here today. At uh, Mark, uh, I believe Mark Thompson has uh, got something for us. We're looking at over here in this corner. Mark, are you there? Hello. 
My name is Drew Raison. I'm the executive director of EMIAP, the Electronic Music Education and Preservation Project. We are proud to be the caretakers of this unique collection of Keith Emerson's stage and studio gear, and even more proud to have been chosen as the end destination and permanent home of Keith's legendary and beloved Moog synthesizer. As a performer, Keith Emerson required a stable of finely tuned precision instruments that were capable of delivering perfection night after night in city after city. Throughout his career, he would work with technicians and visionaries who would modify or craft instruments to meet his creative needs. Emerson recorded ELP's 1971 album, Tarkus, on this highly modified Hammond C3 organ and toured with it extensively. His 1904 Steinway Model B Grand Piano was close to his heart and spawned many critically acclaimed musical works. This was one of Keith's more notorious sacrificial Hammond L100 organs, complete with knives emblazoned with the Emerson, Lake & Palmer logo. This is the actual organ that suffered an on-stage meltdown in Boston back in the mid-1990s. But of course, the icing on the Keith Emerson cake is his legendary Moog synthesizer, which began its life in 1969, toured the globe countless times, and remains the icon of an icon, the wizardry of the great Keith Emerson. You'll find so much intel on this unique collection and so much more at emiapp.org, where we invite you to join us as a free member. EMIAP would like to give a proper shout out to our good friends in the Emerson family, Mari, Mark Bonilla, Brian Kehu, Gene Stopp, and all of Keith's technicians and technical compadres, Michelle Moog of the Bob Moog Foundation, and the entire roster of folks involved in making the tribute concert and this video release possible. Thanks for visiting EMIAP. Check this out. If you haven't already ordered, you're about to. This is the trailer for our DVD. I had never heard those type of harmonies done with that kind of power. And there just wasn't that much classically trained talent in the rock and roll business. But when I heard Keith, I went crazy. When I heard his music, I was like, wow, this is it. As a kid growing up in Detroit, Michigan, I got those albums. I listened to them every single day. You know, with him, it was like, you know, he was obsessed with Keith. There's no way to overstate his influence on us. He's Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles put together for keyboard players. And James Bond. And what Mari has put together, together with Mark and now, it's amazing. Really the finest music made with the finest people on the planet. What a blast and what an honor, all for the memory of Keith, our good friend. All I can say is, wherever you are, buddy, shine on. I'm sure you will. You're welcome. I, uh, I put that trailer together uh, myself on my home computer. I still use a Commodore 64. I put that together. And you may be sitting there watching that trailer thinking, geez, I wish I could have a copy of that concert so I could enjoy it at home. It's your lucky day. You can. You simply go to cherryred.co.uk. You type in Keith Emerson, the DVD you receive, will go to charity completely, 100%, and your DVD will play in all regions. We're not going to waste any time. We move into hour number two, and we do that by showing you yet another clip from the DVD that you're about to order, and then we welcome in studio guests. This is Hoedown.
so good. So good. Love watching great guys who are just really good at what they do go back and forth in exchange. It's so fun to see. And that is on the DVD. We welcome a couple of guys that were on stage for that. We welcome in Ed Roth and Skunk Baxter. Uh, Skunk, I, I'm just going to, and I'm going to get to you in just a minute. Uh, but Skunk, uh, I, I'll say to you, I've always been a doobies freak. Uh, and man, and Steely Dan too. Uh, thank you, man, so much for the years and the putting up with Steely and Dan and all those endless, <laughs> endless takes. But thank you so much, man. Well, a pleasure was mine. Uh, again, thanks for uh, having me to do this and put that. <clears throat> you putting in your time to make this happen. This is a, a really a labor of love. And it's amazing how when people care enough about doing something, how well it comes off. So congratulations on hanging in there all day and all night to do this. Uh, uh, well, uh, what he's talking about is this, this concert that took place in love and, and respect for Keith Emerson, for Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, and Ed Roth, I should go ahead and get to this now. He's the only person that's on this show that once dated Britney Spears. Ed, tell <laughs> us about that experience. You know, she's a lot brighter and more intellectual than you would think. And there, you know, there are plenty of times you want to have conversation with that kind of thing. Mark, it's very nice to see you. Uh, God, Ed, I just love you to death. Uh, seriously, how was it to kiss Britney Spears? She is a good kisser. I will say that. <laughs> I'm going to get in so much trouble, but that's okay. You know. All right, let's 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 find out from the real guy, Skunk. How was it to kiss Britney Spears? <laughs> uh, that's classified. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try this one more time, Mike. How was it to kiss Britney Spears? <laughs> it was great. It was great. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. It was great. Like kissing uh, a dog. <laughs> that wasn't good. That's not a good picture for me. <laughs> <laughs> that went a different place. No, that was, yeah. <laughs> that's why we have to end it right now. Right. Yeah. Now, Mike, I, I want to go to this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into some other stuff. But standing there on stage and watching you guys go back and forth and quite literally play volleyball with licks on a guitar <laughs> that, I mean, it just looked, I, I, I can't and could never do it, but it just looked like fun, Mike. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was fun, right? And this guy over here, Skunk, is the guy that instigated this whole thing. It happened at a rehearsal. We go, let's just bring it to the stage. And it was, we just kind of went, we just kind of did our thing. And the funny thing is I showed him a picture before we came up here that I took of, of that little moment there. And it's one of my most prized pictures, but we just kind of played off each other and just had a blast. And the thing though, with the looks on his face, it would just, were just killing me because he was like, oh, okay, we're gonna do that. Okay, we're gonna do this. Oh, we're gonna do that. Let's do this and let's do that. And it was just a blast, man. It was a great exchange. And when he took it country, that's kind of like my vibe too. I love country. So it was like, game on right and we we had a great time it was fun yeah um skunk let's do talk a little bit about um your and by the way it's from it's great to play with musicians that listen hmm. there are guitar owners <laughs> there are guitar yeah. players and there are guitarists this gentleman is a guitar player and uh, a guitarist thank you, you listen to each other and it's amazing what happens when people pay attention yeah absolutely and that's what we, we had a bucket of notes we know how many we had to use <laughs> And we just said, okay, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's use them up. Yep, absolutely. It was great. Uh, so, Skunk, it'll be great to hear your answer with this because coming from the legacy that you have come from with Steely Dan and, and uh, the Doobie Brothers, uh, to hear your reaction the first time you kind of heard the music of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and your reaction to, I guess, what's categorized as your first experience with progressive rock. Um. I was awestruck because I started out my, my musical journey starting when I was five years old taking classical piano. And I studied that for about eight years. And when I heard Emerson, Lake and Palmer and I heard Keith, I went, I know where this guy's coming from. Mm. And see, there's a little bit of Beethoven sixth and I, oh, little Dvorak, oh, got, yeah. oh, whoa, a little Schumann right there. Yeah. Whoa, <laughs> this guy really knows what he's doing. He's had a strong background. and. 
that immediately made the music, for me anyway, uh, relatable. And then when we finally got a chance to play together, uh, when we uh, put together this band called The Best with uh, Joe Walsh and, and Simon Phillips and John Entwistle, John Entwistle had also been a French horn player. So he had had classical training too. So during rehearsals during uh, Forest of Spider, <laughs> John started to play the theme from Jaws. So immediately, of course, Keith's right all on it, like, you know, on a blanket, and we started playing Jaws. So I thought, okay, let's see what happens if we go into um, Night on Ball Mountain by Mussorgsky. <laughs> Didn't miss a chop. And then all of a sudden we went into Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, and it's like we actually rehearsed this and did it live. And Keith not only had the, the horn parts right, the orchestral parts, it had everything absolutely perfect. It was like standing there and listening to the Boston Symphony Orchestra. This man, the depth of this man's musical ability, he only scratched the surface. And I know he, people say he was brilliant, which he was, is, but the really good musicians only play what they need to play. Mm -hmm. And the depth of this man's um, capability was fearsome. And then we, when we went to Japan, the other thing that I had related to with Keith was he's an historian. He loves history. And so I took my parents with me, and we said, where's Keith? Him and your dad are over there drinking um, Guinness, talking about World War II. <laughs> so... He not only was a great musician, but he understood history, which means he understood how people reacted, how people were, and the way mankind related to itself. And you combine all those things together, uh, that's a ferocious combination. You know, uh, Skunk, it's interesting in that we can talk a little bit about this, because when I look back at my career in radio and the time I packed my car and left my mother crying in the carport to head off on this road of radio, not knowing where it was going. And I look at what it did wind up being, which was very satisfactory. It's not the end, it was, it was the road for me. It was the joy and the travel and the trials and the tribulations, and God knows you've traveled that road. Uh, one would have to think that it was for you, the journey that was the fun thing. Well, it still is. I mean, I, I, hopefully it's gonna go for a long time. And again, that, that ability to say, I'm, I'm not there yet. I actually don't really want to be there yet. I want to keep going. And the ability, to, that gave me the opportunity and the, hopefully the right headspace to play with this fine gentleman where I, it's not what I, I'm going to do. I want to hear what you're doing and see if I can do something with that and interface with you and take all the knowledge that we have, only, only pick the right notes from the bucket, Yep. You know, and it, it was a joy. I mean, yeah, the looks on both of our faces were like a couple of kids. Said, oh, oh, yeah, you want to do that? Oh, let's do that, too. Let's have some more of that. Yeah. yeah. It was a joy. Well, uh, Skunk, I, I apologize. That was my fault because I said was the road for me. Because, I, I mean, look at me. I'll be dead in a week. So I didn't mean <laughs> to uh, put that uh, on you. Uh, we also have with us uh, here Ed Roth, keyboardist Ed Roth. Uh, Ed, tell us about the first time you kissed Tom Cruise. What was that? Like? <laughs> now we're getting into falsehoods here. Nothing against no, no, no. the sexually no. challenged or wh however yeah, we want to talk wait, about wait, it. Wait a minute. <coughs> the word is you know it's the second base with Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that didn't happen, but I did once play at the Scientology Center, which probably is going to get me hate mail, and that was one interesting thing, but it has no bearing on this whatsoever. That is a story over an adult beverage when I when I see you on your boat. And it's a good story, actually. <laughs> they all are. Listen, if you ever get a chance, if you never have, if you ever get a chance to hang with a real musician, just shut up and listen to the stories. You will never hear better, truer, embarrassing things that nobody should ever admit, but yet they do, and it's the best. Um, Ed, look, I met you through Benia, and I, I don't think that I've ever been to an event where Benia was involved that you weren't there. Talk a little bit about, I mean, you're a keyboard player, so I mean, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer had to be an influence for you. Talk a bit about that. Well, huge. I mean, as a guy that loves jazz, which I, I'm going to get some hate mail for that one, too, I, I play out with the jazz trio. 
and Keith managed to play out as a trio where the keyboard player is it. He's leading the train, he's leading the bus. It's Bill Evans playing rock, but with an influence. And all of a sudden you're going, wow, I can actually beat a guy. I, I can lead this thing. Because if, you know, if you're going to, mm. when I came up, if I was going to play straight ahead right now, I'd probably be dead or laying in a gutter somewhere in New York. Because jazz is, it's a different thing. As much as I love it, it's not a great way to make a living. It's, mm. it's even harder way to be a musician. I mean, now I think it's a little better. But anyway, Keith, he, he just had a way of playing that, the melody came through whatever he was playing. And I think that's something that people miss sometimes with all the virtuosity that he had. And you hear this barrage of notes, but yet you're hearing a melody in there. And wow. you always heard a melody. He always had something that sang. And I think that's what put him above, put him above the, rest, the whole rest. I mean, aside from the virtuosity, that's a really special thing. You know, and I, I, it's one of the reasons I picked Hoedown. It's one of those songs I just did. Florida is open, unlike here. And I just did a jazz festival out there, a big outdoor jazz festival. And if there's one song that may not be jazz, but that everybody loves, it's Hoedown. I'll play it on the piano. It slowed down a little bit. And he just, he just had a thing. It, his, his music sang. You know, you can talk about all the great stage presence and and the acrobatics and all of that stuff. And yeah, that's all great. But for me, it's about the music. And that was the special thing. Well, uh, this guy, uh, Ed Roth, who I've been talking to quite a bit, I, I love the fact that, that he not only has been a friend for many years, but I respect him because when the rest of the world heard that Kmart was going to go bankrupt, we all went, oh, this is too bad. Ed ran down and picked up that jacket on the discount rack. <laughs> so, Red, listen, it's the absolute best, man. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I had stock in them before they went down, actually. I took a wicked beating from that. Uh, listen, uh, we got to wrap it up. Skunk, Mike, thank you so much, Ed. Appreciate your time, your efforts as we sell some DVDs today. Appreciate it, fellas. See you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark Bonilla. Uh, for, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, for putting all this together. Putting it together awesome. and speaking for the dead. Pretty amazing. You know, Absolutely. when you're not there, you want somebody to speak for you and champion what you did. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Well said. The absolute is why we're all here. Um, you know, one of the songs that... Uh, was a, a top 40 hit for Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Uh, and it is included uh, in a very unique and special way in this DVD. It is Lucky Man. White lace and feathers Made up his bed A gold the mattress on which he was laid.
Good stuff. My buddy Steve Lukather up there, and he joins us in the gentleman doing lead vocals, Rick Livingstone. Good day, gentlemen. Man, hey, guys. How hey, you hello. Hey. I'm here with my friend. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't need much. So those, of, those of you that have been enjoying the clips, the DVD is for sale. It is at cherryred.co.uk. Type in Keith Emerson. Get your DVD, by the way, it plays in all regions. Do keep that in mind. Um, so... Luke, uh, saw What's you on up, stage, and of course, you, man? How you been hanging dude, out, I'm man? good. How how are you? Look at me. Yeah, well, I mean, you're nuts right now. You got the new record. We'll talk. We'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stuck in my uh, house. So, for Rick. Uh, yeah, yeah, we all have, man. But we're close. I've already gotten shot number one. I got shot two coming up in a week. Um. So, Rick, the vocals on Lucky Man, uh, how does one approach such? Wow. I mean, uh, I was pretty much overcome, overwhelmed by the fact that uh, the tribute was so beautiful and musical. And I just tried to channel something that would, you know, complement what all these guys on stage were doing. So I tried to sing my heart out. Well, it sure came through nice, man. You sounded real good on it. None of that could have happened without all those other people on stage. It's an uh, incredible lineup of people doing what they do best. Well, you know, Ed Roth and the fellas they, uh, in Skunk, they, they talked about it at the end of the last segment. Uh, Mark Benia, a dear friend of all of ours, he, uh, uh, he is fueled by passion. Uh, and this man had a chance to work with Keith get to know him, produce him. And it, I mean, when Vanilla calls, you know, it's going to be a, a quality project. And I think that's one of the reasons that we all are here right now. Uh, and that you guys got together and did what you did uh, for that tribute concert, which was absolutely incredible. Um, my glasses, Luke, guys, sorry. Uh, Luke, you, you should talk about, uh, I mean, because you are a uh, universally world guitar player, coming from all different areas of, of well, the that's instrument. The guy, that's the guy. <laughs> um, so do talk about Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Keith, in in uh, in particular. In oh, the, yeah. In your junior high school, it was the whole thing. Man. Like, you know, the progressive music scene was just blossoming. Yes, ELP, and there was, like, people who you, which side do you want? All that stuff. I love both sides, personally. But Keith... I've known through the years, I got to know him after, see, he's like the Jimi Hendrix of keyboards. Like, and he came out and made keyboards the front instrument. I know this firsthand. And it was amazing what he brought to the table and, and we, all of his classical chops and all that stuff, but he had sounds in his head and he was able to incorporate all this and put it into a gigantic gumbo called the ELP. Well, I mean, just to, you know, to watch the different, because I had never heard anything like that. And I was not, I mean, I was maybe 14 when that first came about. And you, and, and I was hearing mostly yeah. the top 40 version of that. If I was lucky to hear the college radio station, you would hear but deeper cuts. Synth but. Solo, when that synth solo went, you the radio just went, what? WTF. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we did speak a bit with Skunk a little bit earlier about this. Um, Skunk, what is it about the arranging of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's music that do you think is what attracted people? Because I've always been a believer that truth will bring people's attention. So what was it about that thing, the, the relationship between the music and the artwork that people were beginning to experience the first time ever? Well, I think uh, when you listen to Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and especially Keith, for many people, the first uh, thought is, wow, that's so complex and so complicated. <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, on some level, but it's actually very simple. And the universe works on simplicity, the most efficient, the most 
quickest way to get someplace from point A to point B. And when I listened to the arrangements uh, for Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, they were efficient. I, I know that sounds like a, it's not a musical word, but it's efficient because it gets you from point A to point B in the most uh, efficient, the most exciting, the most relevant, the most emotional way. And the arrangements to a T, everything I ever heard, had that universal simplicity to it, getting right from point A to point B. That's rare. A lot of people spend a lot of time trying to get to those places. So underneath that complex ex um, melody, complex harmonies, complex chords, there's a beautiful, beautiful simplicity to it all. That takes wow. talent. Thank you for the time spent, uh, the, the involvement that you had with this concert and this fundraising DVD. Benia spent many, Please. many years trying Please. to find a company that God would release you. this yeah. DVD at no profit to them so the money could go to charity. The music, the clips that you've just seen of this DVD is available to you now. You simply go to cherryred.co.uk, type in Keith Emerson, and the DVD that you purchase will play in all regions. Uh, Skunk, boys, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this wonderful uh, effort and tribute. Good to see thank every you. single one of well, you. Well, again, thank thanks you. to Mark. For, for putting this together um, and giving us all an opportunity to say to Keith what we wanted to say. Nice, and you said it. Apparently. God bless you, Keith. Uh, this is the DVD that we've talked about that is available to you. Uh, you can't do a tribute with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer or Keith Emerson unless you start from the beginning. Face. Man, uh, <laughs> that was amazing, Philippe. Thank you, brother. Even quoted yeah, my I favorite mean, things at the end there. Well, you're my favorite thing. Oh, <laughs> that was a blast. So, so, do, so talk about that piano piece and your influence and where that comes from. Well, um, I think it was... Um, 
one of the few things that would be right up my alley that we could have performed. Uh, you know, just like like Brian Auger said earlier. You know, he was um, he wasn't sure how to fit in, and 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 when my dear friend Mark called me, I, I wasn't sure either how it would fit in. And but I left it. You know, and Mark came up with with this this piece, and I said, well, yeah, I think I can. I can work with that, and knowing that Greg was going to be part of it, so I knew we could take it into some some different, more jazzy places. And the you know we had this this the, the connection, so um, that's where it came from. Just but um, really not knowing, you know, this is a little bit out of my the whole concept was was out of my my comfort zone. But uh, but Mark found the right. You nailed it. Oh, you just you. nailed it, Philippe. I was getting nervous watching this, actually. <laughs> like, I kept, it's like my heart is pounding just watching. You know. wow. Anyway. Well, you, you know, it's got to feel good, you guys, when you step out as musicians into a, a situation where the room is packed with fans of this music that you're bringing back to life. That's got to help the performance level. Absolutely. You know, there were fr friends of mine <coughs> were there that uh, I knew they... <coughs> They were in the front row and they were just freaking out. They, they could recite every lyric from every Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer song. And a lot of keyboard players there, a lot of prog rock players, a lot of serious jazz players, a lot of serious uh, players that are from every instrument. And it was a real, that's always inspiring. It's like playing at the baked potato, but like 10 times that size, 20 times that size. It was a real musician crowd, yeah. and they, they were really, you could tell they were really focusing in. When you would do things, you'd see people nodding and getting into it. And yeah, that was, it was a great, great night, Mark. Which was even much more nerve-wracking for me, because I'm not really a, a, a Keith Emerson aficionado. So anybody who is would know, well, what is this guy doing there? He's just, you know, because I was, was always more into the, 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 the American jazz fusion thing. And um, um, so, you know, I could, I was, oh, no, they're going to think I'm a total fake. What, what no. is he doing here? But uh, Keith would absolutely love and does absolutely love what you did there. And uh, just your touch and your vibe and your rhythmic stuff. And then do raindrops on roses. <laughs> and we went into that jazz waltz. That's classic. Keith is smiling down, man, big time. That's great. Um, I, I had an experience, and I'll share this so I can hear your response. Um, and, and it really kind of deals with the world of creative uh, and, and a live audience. Um, I was doing a play, and uh, we would uh, a full house was 200 people. Uh, and, and I've had nights where we would do the play, and 200 people, places packed, you wouldn't hear a thing. They didn't laugh at the jokes. They didn't cry at the sad stuff. They were just there. I actually did the same play one Sunday night for three people. They were the grandest, greatest audience ever. Now, I know in the world of playing music, you've had the same experience. Man, I have nightmares about that. Nightmares. I have like recurring nightmares every month where I'm, I'm, you know, I go on stage and there's nobody there or the gear is not even plugged in, and yeah. there are people there, but the gear, so yeah, I've got, I get sweats, but just thinking about it. I also have those nightmares, like I'm, I'm playing on a rental kit, and it's not set up, and the symbols aren't on, and there's people there, and they're gonna open this curtain. I mean, Mark, who has curtains anymore? But you, they're gonna open a curtain, <laughs> and you're gonna be like the emperor's new clothes, you know, hey, <laughs> Charlie Callis. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing there, and you're freaking out. But Tony Williams, I used to study with the great, great drummer, and he loved rock just as much as he loved Philly Joe Jones. He loved John Bonham and Ringo, Tony Williams. And Tony would say, just even if it's a small crowd, just look out. Look out in the back and find someone. And if you're going to go, blip it, blip it, blip it, blip it, bop, have a direct line of communication with that one person and just play to them. It's kind of like going to Burger King, and you say, yeah, I want a Whopper with cheese and no pickles. And they give you, when you pull over, a Whopper, a Whopper with extra cheese, uh, no cheese and extra pickles. It's like, wasn't I clear enough? He said, be clear and just don't worry about everybody in the room. Just try to make somebody out there like a direct line of communication. That was Tony's thing. He was 17 when he played with Miles. So he had a lot of that, I'm sure, jitters. I asked him if he was nervous 
17 playing with Miles Davis. He said, I was too young to be nervous. It's not till you get in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. And uh, Absolutely. He, then you get more nervous, right? So you were a little nervous that night? Yeah, definitely. He sure sounded great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these gentlemen are here because they donated their time and their talents to this very special evening where the music of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Keith Emerson, was remembered. Uh, we have a DVD that is for sale, and you can get a copy. Uh, you go to cherryred.co.uk. You type in Keith Emerson. The DVD you get plays in all regions around the world, and the record company makes no profit. Everything goes to charity, which we have talked about. Uh, Douglas, we cut the, the stage in half, and I don't know exactly where I go next, but let me say to Greg, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and, and your talent for coming today and, of course, the concert itself. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for giving your time to do all this great work. Thank you, fellas. Say hi to that wonderful drummer son who used to be my <laughs> student. I used to show him things years ago, and then I went and heard him play. He doesn't need any more lessons. <laughs> <laughs> nice of you, Greg, and I will tell it. Please. This next clip is Tarkus. So, Mike uh, yes, sir. And, and these gentlemen were playing on that last piece, Tarkas. Uh, fellas, to bring about the music of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, it's got to be a challenge. Share with us what that must have been like to a good crowd. <laughs> Hold on. I need a moment of silence to come down from just watching the clip again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, at least, well, I'm a guitar player. I mean, I'll let Jordan, why don't you start off? Can we hear you yet? Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Why don't you start off on that one? Awesome. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, watching the clip was absolutely a trip. <laughs> uh, brought me back to the nerves and excitement of the night. It was a, definitely a lot of energy. And as you know, all of us, we play a lot of shows, but there was something unique about that evening where uh, the energy was especially high and the adrenaline was, uh, you know, happening but it was uh you know so many emotions it, it, that tarkas is probably the most important piece of music in my life and to be able to play it with you know all these guys on that night was uh really beyond words yeah uh jordan let's go back why is tarkas the most Im important piece of music in your life um well i'm getting a lot of echo first of all which is a little making it hard to talk but i'll do my best um, maybe you guys have had some, some headphones or something. I don't know. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, so when I left Juilliard, um, I was totally on the straight and narrow kind of classical path uh, until one day uh, when I was like 17, a friend of my high school friend of mine brought me 
the vinyl of Tarkus, and I put it on, and then I put it on again, and then I put it on again, because I found it to be absolutely mind-blowing. I had known, you know, about a lot of chords, about a lot of harmonies, about a lot of music, but I had never heard anything like that. I had never heard a keyboard player with that kind of power and strength, and it was an awakening. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, I didn't know you could have that kind of, you know, energy with a keyboard. And I was kind of like, well, what, what instruments are they? Like, what's he doing? So, uh, you know, that really in the biggest way, plus a few other things kind of led me down the, you know, the path of, of getting into progressive rock and uh, synthesizers. And uh, I mean, when people, you know, say, who's your biggest influence? I, I have to say Keith Emerson. It's, you know, it's undeniable. It's absolutely, you know, the case. I mean, there are other guys certainly, you know, who have influenced my playing, but he was the biggest turning point in my life from going to be, you know, I was going to be a classical pianist and then Tarkas happened. Uh, wow. And I really went off to another direction. I discovered the synthesizer. I started to look deeper into the kind of chords that Keith was using and bring it into my own uh, musical life. And uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, not a day goes by that I don't think about him and his music and what it means to me because it's a tremendous, you know, influence. Uh, you know, Jordan, that's unique. I find it unique uh, the way that creative, the, the world of creative crosses paths because you're in something, you love it and you think you're pretty good. And then you hear something, see something, read something, and you weren't even aware that that kind of thing existed and it takes you in a different path. That is very uniquely cool that you were able to recognize that and still to this day hold it in a place that changed your world. It's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't know waking up in the morning what's going to happen that's going to really change your life and influence you to get to the next level. And that was one of the definite marks. You know, you reach a, a point and then it's like, wow, all the doors fly open and all these other possibilities uh, happen. So I'm grateful for it. And I was grateful to be part of this amazing concert with all of these amazing musicians. First of all, it's an incredible hang, you know, just coming to L.A. and just meeting everybody, everybody in the band that I played with was just so nice and it was a very warm you know supportive atmosphere for all of us and uh, so happy that this you know this concert's finally going to be kind of seeing the light of day and that we're here to uh you know to reminisce and and talk about keith and uh, this amazing night we had and that it's going to be shared with everybody else for a good cause as well um, let me throw this to all three of you in that it is kind of a creative question in the same vein that we've been talking with jordan about uh, and the craft and the thing that you do. Um, is there an end to it? Is there a wall to advancing, learning new things, getting better? Uh, or does it just crash at an end? You've learned everything and it's over. From the show perspective? Or just In, musically? No, no, no. You as an individual, oh. as a player. I don't know if there's for me... You know, I'm, I mean, I'm a guitar player, so I, you know, I was never a keyboard player listener until I was younger. And I remember when I first heard Keith, I was listening to Zeppelin and stuff like that. I, I heard brain salad surgery, as I've heard a couple other guys say here. And what I heard, I had an eight track tape and I had a friend that that uh, gave me a box and goes, here's stuff I don't like. You listen to it. And I remember I liked the record cover and I was like, oh, what's this? And I stick it in and all I hear is this like low drum thing. And then I hear this, dun, 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 I'm going, what the heck is that? And, and I took my guitar out and tried to learn it off 8-track, which you don't do in the first place. So I went over to my little needle thing and started putting it down. But that, I didn't realize that in my life would be the pivotal point. There's nothing that I've done past that point, even up to this. Coming here today is just resurrecting all those emotions. It does, I, don't, I don't think for me it ends. It doesn't crash because there's always some kind of remembrance. And I mean, Mark and I have been playing guitars together now for almost 30 years and so i've been involved in all this kind of stuff the whole way i think for me too the joy is when i get to hear people talking and all these different drummers i mean i was blessed to be able to play this with keith and play it with you know a lot of guys and mark and i've been through this every day and i'm always just blessed every time i'm asked but it's always fun to watch the new musicians come in like the drummers and <laughs> you know like just listening to greg i was there for that story i have a picture of greg's 40 page chart for tarkas and the fear on him i'm going 
you're Greg Bissonette, man. What are you afraid of? He goes, oh, dude, this is crazy music. Same thing with Troy. <laughs> sitting, same thing sitting with Troy here. And I'm going, oh, and I just remember Jordan, even on this night, that there was, there was just an element of spirit with Keith's spirit amongst all of us. And to bring everybody together where that spirit was so big. And I remember listening to Emerson, Lake and Palmer and going, ah, Keith Emerson, you never think you're going to meet your heroes, you know? And then you get to play with these guys. And I'm expecting Keith's going to be this big 50 foot tall giant guy. And he's a little shorter than me. Say, hey, mate, what's up? You know, we got to hang out and this and that. But so much music. And then just watching that come through each of these musicians, I don't crash on that. I just, this will keep me up now for another couple of weeks, just being here today and talking to everybody and seeing these clips. And now with the DVD out, it's, it's quite amazing. I, I don't crash on so, it. So, Troy, do talk about that. Uh, Benia told me that the concert uh, was the coming together of some of the best players that just rose to that occasion and picked up on the vibe in the room. Your, your, your take on that, Troy? I don't know why he called me, but... <laughs> <laughs> The level of the musicianship, uh, I've never put myself in that class. First of all, it's just been such an honor to be a part of, uh, again, that small part. You know, for me, I, I didn't grow up with um, listening to progressive music uh, for the simple reason. I was playing a lot of rock and roll and grew up with a lot. I loved a lot of music, a lot of different music, all kinds of music. The prog thing, I, I just never felt I was that good of a drummer to really attempt and start to understand that music. But once I started working with Mark and he asked me to do his first record, he had stuff in seven and nine. And once I got familiar with that world of counting and subdividing and getting more comfortable uh, playing a little bit of that music, I'll say a small bit. You know, I've never played, you know, we, we went to Mongolia, you know, we didn't do Tarkas. And then when we went to go record with the orchestra in Germany, they said they were doing Tarkas. I'd never even heard it. So it was news to me, uh, and so I just started shedding on it to get ready to play it with the orchestra. And, and I've only played the song really twice with musicians, which was once recorded with the orchestra. And, the next, and I've never played it live. The only time I've ever played it live was this evening that is this performance. Uh, we did one rehearsal. Um, yeah. It was a quick little rehearsal with Jordan and... You know, uh, I was completely humbled, you know, coming in and working with Jordan. He was just flew, floored me. Just, I was like, wow. So it, it, it was the energy, you know, for me, it was a real strong prayer. And uh, like Mark said, he says, when you do Tarkas, he said, it's like jumping off a cliff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and, you know, with a prayer that we're going to get through it. Yeah. And, uh, and we did, you know, there's a moment you'll see where there's, matter of fact, I don't know if you remember, Jordan, I had a little pickup field to set up your solo. And I spaced in that moment and I'm sitting there and the camera's on my face and you'll see it. And I'm there and Mark, <laughs> Mark doesn't know the story, but he knew that he didn't know at the time but I told him what happened. I go, dude, I go, find another clip. He goes, I love your expression because you're just like in the moment. I'm like, dude, I'm in the moment where I don't know where I'm at. And, <laughs> and, and right when Jordan started the solo, I came in on the downbeat. And I was like, oh, boom, I got, I just kind of jumped back yeah. in, but I missed the pickup, Phil. But, uh, That's funny. No, it was, you, did, you did great, man. It was an awesome <laughs> night. And you know what it's like? It, it's like uh, skiing downhill and not knowing how to stop. <laughs> It was, you know, for me as well, I mean, to be able to play that kind of piece, to just jump up on stage, is kind of like a one-off, is crazy. I mean, usually you, you know, you're playing a set and you're warming up and you slowly build to the complicated stuff or you don't play the complicated stuff yeah. at all. But to just walk up and go right into the depths of Tarkis is asking a lot of anybody. Yeah, but uh, I thought it actually went uh, swimmingly well. It did. Well, we were all smiling. Well, you've uh, yeah. you've had a wonderful uh, trip listening to all of these great musicians come together and talk about a night that happened several years ago to honor the music of Keith Emerson, Emerson Lake and Palmer. You can get a copy. You can have one for yourself by going to cherryred.co.uk. You type in Keith Emerson, uh, and all of the money goes to charity, and the DVD that you receive will work in all regions. This is Fanfare for the Common Man.
Nice. And many of the people that were on that stage for that song have joined us along with Mark Bonilla. Uh, we have Tadahe Mickelson, Vinny Kaluta, and Steve Lukather is back. Steve, good to, yeah, you change your good. shirt. Nice. Welcome, <laughs> gentlemen. Well, my, you know, I'm, I'm breastfeeding right now. It was a little mess. <laughs> <laughs> How unfortunate for all of us to be involved in that. Um, so, fellas, I, I mean, I guess the same question can be asked of all, and what better piece of music than fanfare to talk about? Um, but to to come together as fans of the music of these 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 men, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Keith Emerson, and to be chosen to put that piece of music uh, up on stage. Thoughts into what it meant to you early, early, and what it meant to you on that night. Then you go first. Well, yeah, <laughs> Luke. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored. I'm, I'm here with, I'm here with you, buddy. Not and you. Uh, <laughs> no, that's amazing. Well, I think you know, for me, that was like the sort of the end of the night, and and for me to be sort of uh, to come out at the very end was was a real honor. I mean, the whole thing was an honor for me just to be there. Um, just like like all of my buddies here have said, and to be with these amazing musicians, it was just um, it just goes to show the solidarity that that musicians will come together with, um, and we support each other. We were there to to just you know tip our hat in respect to Keith and 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 the immense musical contribution that he made, and we're all saying the same thing, and rightfully so. Um, and that, you know, I mean, that piece is like a hallmark piece of theirs. So uh, it's it's a huge thing for me. You know, Aaron Copeland um, being arranged into that sort of thing. The, I don't know it what was that like means. a it was like a big hit for them. You know what I mean? And um, somebody's talking into my talking yeah, into my so ear. Sorry. So sorry, <laughs> sorry, baby. But but yeah, a huge honor. And um, I mean, what, what can I say? You know, it's his his whole contribution and and that that piece was it's pretty it's pretty immense man it's pretty immense anybody else well i mean just what can you say about elp so we were in high school i remember there's a whole contingency of you know people like yes or elp i love both bands but the fact of the matter is uh keith emerson's genius is just undeniably he's like the Jimi hendrix of keyboards he was the first guy to come out and turn it into a spectacle and still have the amazing technique and chops and compositional possibilities i mean he's amazing with the synth he's the first guy to bring the synthesizer to the forefront on a pop record little kids were listening going, first time they heard a portamento now they look at an old Demento, and that's me. Okay, boom. <laughs> Vinny, I know it's a union session, man. What's your What's your social security number? <laughs> hey, man. I, you know, Luke. I mean, seriously, I feel I felt the same way because for me, it was the same thing. Junior high school, you know. And when I first heard ELP, it was it was life changing. I mean, yeah. uh, that whole period was uh, there was it was very seminal for all kinds of uh, fresh new music that was coming out of the woodwork. I, I don't know about you. Everywhere. I don't know about you, but for me, it was like first time I got into odd times and, and oh, really yeah. understanding how that fits into melodic music. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, remember, we're just a bunch of rock and rollers going like, wow, this is some deep stuff. What's going on? This is powerful. Really powerful. I want a piece of this. Uh, Mr. Mickelson, we uh, we can't yeah, go without think, hearing something from you to have to orchestrate something like this. Well, I think it's uh, very symbolic for um, for uh, Keith uh, in a way of showing that he was very serious about selecting his music. And he also, um, I was growing up in the classical world and uh, many of my teachers when I was young, they were sort of... Uh, uh, putting down what he did and say, hey, oh, you can't do things like that with serious composers. And suddenly, when I met Keith and we started talking, he was very well read into music. He knew a lot about music. And especially when he played me a, a tape where Aaron Copland was talking about 
uh, ELP playing uh, the fanfare for the common man and actually accepting that uh, they did it. And uh, he said, uh, especially that as long as they start with my original part and end with it, I, I think what they do in the build, I don't really understand it, but uh, I, it's interesting and they're allowed to do it. So he got the blessing from the composer. And that's why I, I really wanted to have this on the Three Fates Project album we recorded in Munich, just to, to prove that Keith had uh, the permission to do this and uh, he did a fantastic adoption. And um, this this is... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, he's connecting the worlds and he's, he's opening, he, he opened a lot of ears. Many of the great pianists I play with on a daily basis, they, uh, they were inspired by Keith and they were envying his uh, left hand, which was fantastic, uh, technically. And also um, myself, I um, was very inspired listening to the pictures at an exhibition and the Mussorgsky piece, and uh, I, I know he, he has changed many lives by what he did and how he sort of presented his music uh, to people and, and, and trying, to, uh, trying to have two worlds meet. And uh, when we talked uh, uh, together, he always said I, he wanted to be a composer, he wanted to be accepted in orchestras. And I can say when we recorded in Munich, uh, we had rehearsed a lot together, um, Keith, uh, Mark, uh, Troy and, uh, and Travis. So when we came, we were totally in sync and the orchestra got shocked when we entered there. And uh, <laughs> Keith was very nervous. And, and uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, a little bit shaky, but the musicians in the orchestra, they had to really sit up on the chairs and really give a really uh, big effort to keep up with that with the band side and and uh, it made me really proud to see that we could could merge these two different parts uh, and that was what made keith so happy that he, he cherished this recording also when we performed this in london later together so so i i feel that um keith's uh, legacy is of course being uh, 40 years in a row, number one keyboard player in the world. But much more, I think, changing the lives of many people and opening the ears for people to accepting classical music also by playing it like talking to you and, and, and making you want to, to investigate more. Of it. So, so uh, for this um, reason, I think that he will be remembered for a very long time, not only for his playing, but also for his sort of education, uh, his, sort of his uh, compositions, and uh, making music interesting to listen to, to people who maybe sometimes didn't even think about listening to music. So, um, I yeah, I, uh, I think I, interesting. I, I, I feel honored yeah. being here and I mean, listening to all these <laughs> world-class players in uh, which were on what many consider the competing team in music but i feel this is we're all a big family in music um, and uh, music talks he talked a lot with his music so um what a memory what a great uh, dvd to to have and uh, and i think that uh, mark will uh, really be um, what's it, cherished and and praised for giving so much effort five years putting this together First of all, putting the whole concert together and then fighting, fighting, fighting for this. And now it's there, Mark. Mark, congratulations. I really. Yeah, really absolutely it. true. Yeah. And, and I think. It's MVP for sure. Oh, I think it's I think it's proven the amount of people that we've heard from today. The entire concert is yours. You simply go to cherryred.co.uk. <clears throat> you type in Keith Emerson. Uh, and and all regions will play the DVD that you'll get, and all the money goes to charity. Gentlemen, thank you so much for the time to come and join us and spin. Thank you for it. Thank you for having me. Thank us. you. Thank you. Calm, being here. Thanks, Mark. Maestro, um, honor to see you. Thank all you. of us. Hope to see you soon. <clears throat> and we can talk uh, nasty stuff another time. Okay, good. Where's Benia? Marcus. Hi, buddy. I'm here. 
I just well, I just got stuck in the in and out line for a while. So, <laughs> so dude, uh, listen, there is um, uh, 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 along with the love for Keith, there's a lot of love for you from all of the people that uh, I have been speaking with for the last few hours and uh, much love, much respect for you from these people. And this is cream of the crop, these people that you carry as a friend and that you brought together for this. And I think everybody uh, puts you on a pedestal for walking the path you walked five years. Nobody else was picking up the phone. You carried this for your deep, deep love and friendship for this man who was a game changer for you. You made friend of him. You honored his music, and you've done a wonderful thing here today for carrying that torch for the for the man that can't carry it right now. Well, you know the thing is, you and I, and I, I think I can speak for everybody that, that was here tonight and everybody that played that night. And the fact that Keith was such an inspiration an inspiration to us, not only as as keyboardists but as guitar players, as 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 composers, as as melod, just melody, everything about it. So if if you can give back a little bit, that's a little bit of payback. It will never pay back what it was worth, you know? And so for, to me, it, it, I had to do this, you know, it just, and, and that's why everybody just signed on to do it, you know? And because I think they all felt that, hey, this is an opportunity that we got to give back a little bit, you know, to, to, to somebody that was such an icon and such a leader uh, and, and pioneer in so many different areas from classical to rock. Uh, changed so many people's lives and one life changed can have a butterfly effect that like you can't believe let alone so many of the lives that he changed affected the entire world i mean that sounds uh, like large but it but it really is the case he changed the world he left the world a better place than when he when he first entered and you have to pay tribute to that you know and and uh, that's what we all did today well Mark, I'll, I'll take it a step further, and, and I think that uh, there are too many people that do not take advantage of this, um, and, and I think wrongfully so. But you walk the right path of carrying friendship. It means a great deal to you to have a genuine friend, somebody that you were kismet with. And Keith was that friend, both uh, personally and professionally. And you have been here today and for the last five years, you have been a great friend to him. And that's very moving to see. Well, thank you. I mean, it's again, and like Vinny was saying, the, the, it, it shows you what musicians in this community here, uh, they're, they're strong and they pull together and we support each other, especially through this last year where we've had a real hard time. Everybody came today, everybody supported each other. And I'm, I'm flattered and honored to be part of that group, man. And it's, you, you have no idea what it means. And uh, <sighs> it's, it's pretty overwhelming. So. But I do want to thank some people, though. And I got a little list here. So I want to do that because they're too damn important to, to, to miss or else this wouldn't have happened. And, and, and first and foremost, Dirk Schubert, who gave us our, our, a place to rehearse and he brought his entire sound system down for it it was amazing what he did he put his he put everything into it hired the guys uh you know he's one of those true believers and then chris quilty gave us this entire facility to use uh you know on his dime uh you know and then of course ron garrett in alert the globe saw the concert and called me up and says what do you need you know and he made this all possible and then he called uh, doug armstrong and doug saw the concert and says, I'm going to bring my touring truck. I'm going to hire the guys to do all this stuff. I mean, everybody pitched in, you know, all of, of Doug's crew, Steve, Rex, uh, Aldo, Natalie, Kayla, Buster, everybody pulled together. And that was the whole spirit of this thing from the beginning was everybody <clears throat> flowed in the right direction, you know. And, and, and when that happens, it's, it, it rarely ever happens in life where you have that many working parts, that many moving parts, going in the same direction with the same intent, you know, and it's, it, it really does rekindle my faith in mankind. And, uh, you know, it, it's like, uh, Troy Lachetta's father once said, he said, there's a, 
nothing is, uh, you can't wait too long for a good thing. And uh, it took five years in this case, but uh, it's all right. It, it's supposed to happen in the time that it happens. And I want to thank everybody that participated in this. And you all know who you are. We couldn't have done it without one of you. So thanks to all of you. Uh, well, let's give another shout out one more time. Uh, the DVD. You know what? Even if you didn't really care for Keith Emerson's music or Emerson, Lake and Palmer, this DVD has some of the best working musicians anywhere in the world. And for two and a half, three hours, you get a chance to watch that live. An incredibly performed, incredibly filmed concert. All the money you spend goes to charity. You go to cherryred.co.uk. You type in Keith Emerson. The DVD you're going to receive uh, goes to and plays in all regions. Also, um, I'm trying to find it. There is a special HD Blu-ray quality digital download available on the 11th, and then on March 19th, the DVD CD box set is all yours. Mr. Benia, thank you so much for doing this and, and being a part of the human race. Well, thank you for being the MC for all of this. It would not have gone off with all these parts without you there doing what you do so well. I mean, you're a true friend and you're a total consummate professional, and I was honored to have you part of this, Ben. It was like a whole, it was like a family reunion. It really was. And, and uh, you made it so. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Marcus, every time I called you and said, I need this, I need that, your answer was yes, you can call me anytime. And the answer is I'll try to get back to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. All right. Well, now I know where I stand with you. That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. You've always known where you stood with me. <laughs> oh, man. And listen, thank you for everybody for tuning in, too. And please uh, buy a copy of this, man, uh, and donate to the charity because we do need to raise awareness for focal dystonia for our musicians and everybody else. And, uh, and you're going to get some amazing performances by, and a one-of-a-kind performance uh, on this DVD. So uh, come March 11th, man, I want to see sales rack, okay?